Good morning, everyone. If you guys can hear me out in the lobby, we're going to start in five minutes. So go ahead and make your way into the sanctuary, find your seat. Looks like there's plenty of room in here now. If you can hear me out in the lobby, make your way into the sanctuary, find your seat, and let's focus in on Jesus this morning and get ready to worship. All right, good morning, everyone. Let's stand to our feet. 
we can get everyone out of the lobby, make your way in here, into the sanctuary. Ushers, if we can close the door once the last person gets in here. Are you guys ready to worship Jesus this morning? That was okay. It kind of sucked. Let's try it again. Are you guys ready to worship God this morning? That's better. That's better. That's better. Welcome to Risen Nation Church. We just love Jesus here. Welcome those that are watching online. We love you. We bless you. We pray that your life is never the same. Somebody say amen. How many of you are thankful to be in his presence? How many of you know that we can never take for granted the fact that we can enter into his presence, that he has grafted us, that he's called us his own, he's grafted us into his, his body, his life, who he is. And we should be ab above all people most grateful because he's so worthy. What's amazing about Thanksgiving is it's not just the rejoicing over something good, but it's also a prophetic declaration when things aren't that good. So it doesn't matter what state you've come in, what you're going through, what state of mind you're in, how your week was. Thanksgiving is something that we can always give to God. Worship is something that we can always give to him. It's the only thing that he can't give in return that we can bless and honor him and worship him with our lives, regardless of what's going on. Amen. So I want to do something this morning. I want to read Psalms 47. It just take a, two minutes out of the Passion Translate. It says, go ahead and celebrate. That's the first line. Can we celebrate this morning? Go ahead and celebrate. Come on and clap your hands, everyone. Shout to God with the ruckus sound of joy. The Lord God most high is astonishing, awesome beyond words. I want you to get how amazing he is. He's the formable and powerful Form, formidable and powerful king over all the earth. He's the one who conquered the nations before us and placed them all under our feet. He marked out our inheritance ahead of time, putting us in the front of the line, honoring Jacob, the one he loves. God, this is the verse I love, God arises with the ear-splitting shout of his people. There is something so simple and yet so profound with a shout unto the Lord. Because what it does, it's, it's a declaration of his victory. It's the children of Israel standing at this wall of Jericho, this impossibility. And before they even had the victory, God said, I want you to shout now. Before anything happened, it was a shout, it was a proclamation, it was a declaration, it was a prophetic shout of victory for God's people. It was a prophetic shout that God is good. So I believe this morning, I was feeling this all week, I believe this morning that I just want to, before we start, I just want to shout and I believe that things are just going to break off lives before we even start. That there is going to be a sound of thanksgiving, there is going to be a sound of praise, there is going to be a shout that echoes out of this place that catches the attention of heaven, that catches the attention of God and says God arises when his people shout. So I want to encourage you as you lift your hands to heaven. There is something so amazing, there is something so incredible about no matter what is going on, no matter how difficult it's been, no matter the circumstances, no matter the obstacles, no matter the valleys, the highs and the lows, we all go through it and we all have things we need to overcome. No matter all of that, there is one thing we can do. We can proclaim the victory of Jesus over our life by shouting the name of Jesus by shouting his goodness, by shouting how gracious he is, by lifting a shout of praise because he's worthy. God, arise in this place, in the shout of your people. Come on, lift your voice. God, arise in your temple this morning through our praise. Arise from your rest and be blessed in this place, Lord Jesus. Arise from your rest and be blessed, Jesus, by the shout of your people, because you're worthy, because you're holy. No matter what is going on, God, you're worthy. No matter what we've been through, no matter what highs, no matter what lows, no matter what temptations, you are worthy, God. When darkness surrounds us, you're worthy, God. When we find ourselves in the pit of hell, you are worthy. You are holy, and we will shout 
shout to you forevermore. We will shout to you, God, till we can't shout anymore. We'll worship you, Jesus, when nothing else is going on. We'll lift the sound of praise, whether we feel like it or not. We'll lift the sound of praise, whether it's good or not, whether we can sing or not, whether we're happy or not. Because you're worthy, Jesus, we pray, God, that you arise and stand up in our midst today and break off everything of us that doesn't belong. Crucify everything in me, God, that is not of you, that the only thing that remains is the life of Christ. And we worship you. We worship you. We honor you. We bless your name. Give them one more shout. Come on.
be praised with angels and saints who we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised I remember you will be praised Chosen 
He stepped into silence He longed for my presence Breathed life in the dirt He loved me first His love desired me 
Whose love 
Would you all lift your hands as a sign of surrender? If you're sitting down, could you please stand? And I want you to begin to make a sound in the room, singing in the spirit, praying in the spirit. Just forget who's around you, close your eyes, step into union with the Lord. Just allow them to make a sound for a second. Come on, lift your voices, lift your voices. Come, every voice, every voice, not one silent, not one silent. Join in. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Keep going. Go vertical. Go up, go up, go up. Build it, build it. Build it. Take us, God, from glory to glory. Take us, Jesus, from glory to glory. Keep filling the room on the symbols. Build it on the symbols. Come on, take us, Jesus, from glory to glory. From glory to glory.
voice. Come on, do it again, do it again. Give him your attention. Give him your attention. Noah, come in. Lord, end all activity today. power of your presence. Remove every veil, every distraction. Our 
are so desperate for your glory, Lord. You will not enter into something man-made. So here we are with no plan, no agenda. We want your presence, Lord. In this environment that you heal our bodies, to restore our minds. Jenna, where's Jenna at? I know you're believing for healing. I want you to go dance. And as you dance, God's going to strengthen your body. Just minister to the Lord, Noah. Worthy is your name, Lord. Come on, give him your attention. Close your eyes. Put your hands. God, I thank you that in this moment, Every single one within the sound of my voice, watching online or in the room, that you would cause bodies to be whole right now. In Jesus' name, strengthen Jenna, Lord. Strengthen Jenna, God. Strengthen Jenna, God. You will not be bound to a bed. You will not be bound to a bed. Exodus 12, verse 3. It says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man, every single man shall take a lamb according to their father's house. I love this because the plan in motion of the crucifixion of Christ for the sake of his church, the type and shadow that we find in Exodus, it's a lamb for every man. It's personal. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. 
So they got used to the lamb being in their house. When the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight, it's the same time, twilight, that Christ gave up the ghost. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. They had to eat the whole lamb. And anything that remains till the morning shall be burned. In this manner you shall eat it, your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, which is implying you're ready. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When you see the blood, I will pass over and no plague shall befall you, destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So lift your hands. Lord, we've come this morning to eat the whole lamb. Our sandals on our feet, our belts around our waists, staff in hand, ready for that day, Lord. But we don't have to wait to eat of you. We don't have to wait to drink of your blood. Thank you that there's a fragrance that you're giving us. You're bringing us back to the glory that's found only in the face of Jesus. So make your blood real today, Lord, in their bodies. Make your flesh real today, God, in their bodies and in their minds and their families. You were the lamb that was slain for every single one of us individually. Come more real today, Lord. We don't need all the noise. Lord, we don't want any hype. We want the manifest presence of your glory. Lord, we're not satisfied where we are. We're thankful, but we're not satisfied. Lord, I want, and you know what I want, you to be so real that wheelchairs are not allowed in this room. The depression is not allowed in this room. Reveal your secrets to us today. Fascinate us again we may look at you rightly. We come to eat the whole lamb. Come on, if you want to eat the whole lamb, lift your hands. The entire lamb. May nothing be wasted today, Lord. May nothing be wasted. We give you our attention. And throughout the rest of this service, I would encourage you, if your mind begins to wander, make an intentional effort getting it back to the lamb. We're going to eat the whole lamb. We pray that not one leaf today, God, the same. Those that don't know you, God, pull on their hearts today. Those that need to come back to you, pull on their hearts today. We're in this for the long haul, building equity with you. Not here to impress people, but here to attract you, God. May we be attractive, an attractive place to your presence. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said amen. 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 Yeah, you can give the Lord praise. That's good. Yeah. Bless the worship team. That was amazing. 
How many of you walked in here today and uh, it was colder? Curtis, can you stand up? So this is Curtis Cotton, if you don't know. He's the one that took care of the AC for us. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so if you, have any, uh, if you have any AC needs, I would uh, recommend you see him. Um, I, my whole life has been um, in the construction world and contracting, and so I have a... I have a lot of experience in dealing with people and um, you know contractors can be good at what they do but they can suck at communication and they can be good at communication and they can be terrible at what they do so it's not very often that you find someone that does both and he, he does a great job and he communicates well so you can't ask for any more than that so if you need anything go to see him and don't think you're going and going to get some kind of smoking deal either like go and actually pay him what it's worth to do the work so other than that, welcome online. Sorry, you guys don't, uh, you guys can't see Curtis. A um, couple announcements before we uh, actually, let's do the offering first and I'll do the, the announcements. If the ushers could come, um, you know, we get a chance to continue in worship by giving the tithe and our offering. And part of that goes to things like the AC. If it wasn't for uh, generous people, we wouldn't be able to do the things we need to do around here. So. We thank you for your generosity, and we promise to be good stewards of it. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for these people. I thank you for their generosity. God, and I thank you that you're the perfect example of generosity, that we want to be like you. So we're going to be a generous people, and I ask you to bless these people as they give in Jesus' name. All right, we can pass the buckets. A um, couple announcements. We have, this is the last week that you can um, register to vote out there. So if you haven't done that, you need to. And they have um, a bunch of information out there for um, general elections, um, polling day locations, early voting, all kinds of information like that that you might need. So if you need to know any of that stuff, I suggest you stop by there. Um, we are in need of volunteers uh, for the holiday season. You know, as people travel and go back home, um, especially females, um, we need some help. Obviously, men too, but the females carry the load. So um, if you haven't signed up to serve, uh, we ask that you do. You know, part of being um, a member of a family is that you help out. You know, so we ask you to serve. Uh, lost and Found is at the coffee bar. So if you've lost something, go find it. Um, the, I'm sorry, there's a, so if you want to serve, you can sign up to serve at risenation.org forward slash serve. And our prayer email is prayer at risenation.org. So if you have any prayer requests, please send them there. We would love to partner with you. Um, don't forget October 18th, we are starting the Financial Peace University with Joe Don and Mary Lee Easter. So on Tuesday nights at 6.30, they'll be hosting that class, and, and that can really change your life. I'm, I'm a firm believer in a lot of things that uh, Dave Ramsey preaches. So we have a live recording coming up on November 18th. Uh, one of those songs that you heard today will be on there, um, and I, I honestly hope the whole world gets to hear that song, and I think they're going to. Um, so if you want to sign up, it's ages 13 and up. So no, no child care, but um, if you want to sign up, obviously there's going to be limited seats in here just because the room's limited. So make sure that you do that. We have habitation coming January 19th through 21st. So save that date. And um, we've decided that we will be opening registration for it. I believe it's this Wednesday. Um, but you're going to want to register quick because seats are going to be extremely limited. So, um, are we telling them where we're having it yet? Is that, yes? I heard Pastor William yell yes from the back. So, the uh, Habitation Conference is going to be in this room. Yeah. So, that means it's going to be limited. So, don't jack around. Like, register immediately and, or else, I don't want to hear it. 
this week, we don't have anything here at the building. There's not going to be any prayer rooms. Um, we're, Pastor William mentioned it last week. We're going to be doing kind of what we call the reset week and getting the building kind of in order. So it's probably going to be destroyed for most of the week. Um, so there won't be any prayer rooms. There won't be, um, there's no way or youth either, right? Right. There's nothing this week. Okay. Um, I forgot to welcome the first time guest. So if you're, it's your first time, you know, welcome. Uh, with that being said, let me, let me ask you guys something. How many of you came here and you came to Risen Nation and you left going, man, that place is different? Pretty much everybody. So let me, let me tell you why this place is different. Because the leader's different. So, um, and I, I mean that. I'm, I'm probably not the closest person to him in the room, but I'm one of the closer people to him in the room. And he's different. And we benefit from that. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and honor him as he comes, Pastor William. Thank you. Can sit down. Yeah, thanks. Just, just give me a minute. One minute. Uh, and I wanted to also remind you, thank you, Pastor Tanner. That really blessed my heart felt a tear start to, to well up. Um, just one tear. Didn't fall, though. Um, so I really feel like habitation is going to be wild in this room. And a uh, small correction, I think we're going to open registration next Sunday, like on Sunday. Yeah, Wednesday. It's probably Pastor Costi probably put it in there. Wednesday. Yeah. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out because we understand that not everybody's going to fit in here. And so uh, we'll have probably a certain price for this room. And then once this room fills, a certain price for overflow. Uh, so I, I, I want our church to be here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we have so many people that come in from out of town. And uh, I think this last one we just did, even the kind of smaller regional one we did in Dallas with people think from overseas come. So um, I really want to encourage you when we open it, I believe that we are going to have a specific code that only you in this room will see. Um, and so next Sunday, be ready to sign up for habitation. My, uh, my uncle, Pastor Benny will be with us. There's a couple more people we're waiting on, um, but it's going to be different. We're going to go Friday night just due to the parking and stuff. We're going to go Friday night through Sunday night. Okay. And, uh, and then on Monday morning, we're also excited because that is the orientation week for School of Habitation. Anyone excited about that? And uh, what's going to be amazing is we are going to have, you know, Corey and Eric and our, and our crew and all of us pouring into the students leading into Habitation. And then we will have a special schedule, uh, which I believe will be Monday through Wednesday for School of Habitation that specific week. And my uncle, Pastor Benny, will be with the students on Monday. So I really want to encourage you, even if you're like, I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to go, but I'm not sure how I'm going to put the money together for it. I would just encourage you, still tell us so we can pray with you, so we can stand with you um, and see what our team can do to help you. But um, I just have a ridiculous anticipation in our hearts. And if you've signed up for School of Habitation, just know we'll have a specific discount code where you will not pay, obviously, for being at Habitation because that'll be part of the curriculum. Amen? Okay, that was it. You guys okay today? Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Um, I, I'm not really sure. Thanks, man. Appreciate it all. See you in five. Uh, I'm not. A joke works every time. I say it all the time. Still laugh. Uh, very, very faithful, patient with me. But I had a plan, right? And then this morning, I woke up and the Lord changed the plan. So I've never actually felt more unprepared in my entire life. So I just scribbled a bunch of things down, and we're going to see what I throw up. Um, but usually, when the Lord is in a mood, by the way, Curtis, I just honor you. I feel a draft right now, and I could cry. I'm so thankful for the draft. Wow. Can we honor the Lord for giving us the provision to be able to do it? So thankful. Yes. Um, what was I saying again? 
the giraffe, the giraffe uh, distracted me. The Lord's in a mood. He is in a mood, man. He's been in a mood. Uh, he has, uh, the, especially those that go to, how many of you have ever like attended a 6 a.m. prayer room or one of the night ones? Um, there's just been a different fragrance, the only way that I can say it. Uh, and how many of you know glory, it follows order? Okay. Guys, I'm confused. You're confused. At least help me today, okay? But glory follows order, right? And in uh, 2 Chronicles 5, it was the order that David put in place that his son followed that caused the cloud of glory to come in that the priest couldn't stand in the midst of it once everything was in order. So much so that it says that it wasn't until the priests were singing and worshiping as one that the glory came. Acts 2, you see the same thing. They were in one accord. And so the Lord has been putting some things in order. He's been putting um, things within me and our leadership in order, cultural stuff, things that we will not budge on as a community, things that we're not uh, gonna just be lackadaisical about because I think we don't have a complacent problem. We have a lot of events going on. Like we, I'm talking about the church at large. There's a conference for everything and there's people there at every single one. I think we've got a lot of activity and there's a lot of people that wanna go and they're hungry to go. I don't, I don't think we have a complacent problem in our generation. I think we have a casual problem in our generation. And, uh, and so sometimes when I'm preparing for Sundays, you know, I had, I, I'm gonna, I'll just tell you the truth. I was feeling like I was supposed to talk about like overcoming offense today, right? And that's like a good pastoral thing to preach. That's what we should preach and we need to talk about it and we need because I believe one of the biggest cancers we have in church today is offense. Offense, and then we go to another church with our offense, and then we f you're gonna be offended anywhere you go when it's inside of you. And then you're gonna find each other. The offended people find each other, and they have offense camps, and then they start, then they are like, you know what? We can't find anywhere that's good, so we're gonna start a healthy church. <laughs> and you started, in a, you started an offended church. And then you're mad at the church and you're not preparing the bride, you're telling the bride everything that offended you about the other church. And it seems like wisdom in James three to be bitter. But James three says that that wisdom is sensual and demonic. And bitterness is the fruit of offense, right? And so it, I mean every, I heard Bill Johnson say, every bitter person uh, gives they usually have a really good reason of why they're bitter. And they can reason their way into, I am offended and I deserve it. Because this person didn't text me back. See, the, we have a problem. And we have offended people here. We have people leave every week because they're offended. Especially when Cito preaches. And you know what, you know what my plan is? You know what my plan is? I'm gonna have him keep preaching. That's my plan, because there's nothing casual about him. Just gets all the casual out of the room, and you really have to decide, am I in or am I out? This house is different because we're freaks. Jesus freaks, of course. All right. So I have a tension. The tension is, is I can teach you how to overcome your flesh and temptation, which is good and it's needed, but I think we do a disservice a lot as ministers. And that's we preach more to your flesh and your soul than your spirit. And if we could get to the root, which is if I can awaken that thing inside of you that there's discoveries, there's things about yourself that God wants you to discover that will cause your soul and your flesh to come into alignment. But I think we're trying to do it the wrong way. We're trying to go from the outside in when this thing is inside out. And so, so, I, so usually I'll have this like pastoral plan that is good for growing churches and the Lord is like, no, I want you to talk about something confusing because if we can awaken the spirit of the man, the soul and the flesh will follow. 
So I can either tell you you're nothing but a disgusting sinner and let's figure out how to patch ourselves until he comes and fixes everything, or I can go and talk to the truth of your spirit that says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that will cause the soul and the flesh to go, you're right. Because your sin is not right. Your flesh is not truth. The truth is in your spirit. So I, I wanna talk to our spirit today, okay? And just be patient with me. And then I'm gonna have my mom come and sing an old song over us because the Lord told me to and it's gonna be amazing. All right, go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. And this is really gonna be like the main text, but we're gonna go 100 places. This might be the only one you turn to. Start in verse 10, and I am in the ESV. Just so you guys are aware back there, if you're trying to follow me, I'll be also in the New King James, so I'll just tell you if I go back and forth. All right. Then the disciples, are you guys in verse 10? Say amen if you are there. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets, better translation, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. For to one who has, more will be given, and to he will ha who has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 13, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, listen, they do not see. In other words, although they have eyes, they don't see with them. Seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in, this, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. It's really important. You will see, but you won't see, okay? For the people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes have closed. This is... This is the red letters, words of Jesus, okay? He's not bashing his bride. He's looking for her, okay? Lest they should see with their eyes. In other words, lest they should turn and actually begin to see and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, I will heal them, okay? So the disciples come to him and the way of Jesus' teaching, the best teacher in the world, is almost frustrating because you're like, why don't you just tell me plainly, right? Like I love when the disciples are like, finally, he's talking to us plainly. Remember when they say that? He begins to explain to them. And the stuff that like you really wanna know that's not parables, they throw it in there like he spent 40 days and talked about things pertaining to the kingdom of God before he ascended, but they don't talk about what he talked about. And then we're all mad at each other because everyone's got a different theology. But the Bible is kind of like this mysterious veil, right? So Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm, I, don't, I don't tell them plainly because it's not given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but it's given to you, not because of his sovereignty, but because you have eyes that you see with and you actually have an ear to hear. So most of the parables Jesus would preach, he would end with, to him who has an ear, let him hear, okay? So that word mystery, and I want you to write some of this stuff down, that word mystery, because I, I really believe that the Lord is leading us uh, into measures of his glory. It's something our leaders, we've been talking about. I, I got a profound text from Pastor Jenny that I think might be somewhat responsible for what I preached this morning, okay? Because there is, there's mysteries that God wants to reveal that if we aren't willing to go into them, deep into them, we are never gonna see the glory of God. And, and the glory of God is, is, I heard my dad describe it beautifully the other day. He said, because I was asking about the glory, and what is the difference between his presence and his glory if his presence is his person? He made this statement, and he said, if you look at the sun, you really can't look at the sun. And if you do, you're blind for like a minute after, right? But if you put your hand over the sun, you still see the rays of the sun coming past your hand. It protects your eyes, but you still feel the heat of the sun, right? So 
We have God's presence. He's here. We can feel him. We can see the effects of him. But the glory is there's no longer a hand over the sun. The glory is the veil is taken away and it, the intention is that you become blinded. Right? He said that to me at breakfast the other day. I was like, time out. <laughs> the intention is, is that we get all of him. It said when Moses wanted to see the glory of God, which I've always been confused about because right before that, he's saying in the same chapter, it's saying that Moses knew the Lord face to face and God talked to him like he would talk to a friend. Moses, what, do you else, what, what, what else do you need, Moses? And Moses is saying, Lord, if you'd be so kind, show me your glory. And the Lord says, okay, I'm gonna have all, everyone say all, all, all of my goodness pass before you, right? Jesus was present with the Pharisees, but the Pharisees did not see his glory, right? And so glory is hidden, it's veiled. It's something that requires participation from those receiving it. Are you with me? And I just believe with all of my heart that God is taking off the veil. And if we could dare to believe as a community that God is interested inside of a community of people to remove that veil, and so we're blinded by the sun, S-O-N. And we become so blinded, like it says in Psalms 34, that what we're beholding, we become like. I'm telling you, I have a, I, I went to bed last night. I've, I've never experienced this shaking. I, I, don't, I don't know what's coming. I just know something is coming. And we can't ask for it casually because, well, I'm going ahead of myself. He's delivering us from casual. All right. Mystery, listen, that word mystery in Matthew 13. It means a sacred secret. I want you to write it down. A sacred secret. And as you go deeper, listen to the word sacred, I, I heard someone that I would consider a scholar um, did a word study on mystery and on that word sacred. And in Greek, you'll find this phrase, listen, something hidden from the common gaze. Write it down. Something hidden from the common gaze. So Jesus is telling them, there's things that I have to tell you that are hidden from the common gaze. The parable, the glory of God, I mean, you were talking about Hebrews 1 says he is the manifestation of the glory of God. He's, his face is the glory of God. Jesus is the glory, right? But how he shares himself and his presence is in dimensions based on the receiving end. Are you, are you tracking with me here? Okay. So, Mystery, listen, that word mystery, the point of mystery is not to confuse you, okay, so you can't figure him out or figure out who he is. It's that you can't find out who he is until you get out of a common and casual gaze. The point of mystery all over scripture, like you read the book of Revelation and you are like, this thing is a riddle. I'm, just to be really vulnerable with you, I read Romans 9. Anyone ever read Romans 9? Um, <laughs> I read Romans 9 this week. Now, I have to take, you know, taste my own medicine because you got to keep reading and it really starts to make sense in chapter 10 because it's a whole letter. But I finished Romans 9. I closed my Bible before the Lord and I said, I don't get this at all. This is your pastor, <laughs> teacher. I read Romans 9 and it's all about the sovereignty of God and how Pharaoh, these are, these are Bible words. Pharaoh's an instrument in the hand of God. Wait, wait, time out. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Time out. That's against like every theology thing that I hear preaching. But it's in the Bible, so we, gotta, we, we can't take out sections of the Bible. And it's all for the revealing of the glory of God. What? I mean, read Romans 9. If you're offended and you leave because of that, you don't like the Bible. Because it's there. It is there. I promise you it's there because I read it and I was just as confused and I closed and I'm not here to give you an answer because I don't know. <laughs> but here's what I can tell you. Here's what I can tell you. It's all under this one thing, removing my gaze from common yeah. into I, wow. Amen. Right? And so I closed the Bible. I said, I don't get this at all. And then I felt the presence of the Lord. And it was kind of like, 
Not that the point is to be an idiot. <laughs> Hear me out. I told you today's going to be ugly. It's going to be weird. But, but the point is that there's something beyond the words. Right? It's, it's beyond the veil. It says that in Scripture, we're going to read it in, in a little bit, but in 2 in Corinthians, but it talks about there's a veil that still lays over the Scriptures for some. Right? And you're going to experience things. You experience the presence of God in the holy place. You do. Where the candlestick is, where the showbread is. I mean, that's powerful, but there's, there's a veil there. And you guys heard me, have heard me preach this, but the veil is not at the outer court. We preach like it is. The veil is not between the world and the outer court. The veil is not torn when you pray a prayer, believe it or not. It's already been torn, but it doesn't mean you've walked beyond it. Right? So you don't walk beyond the veil when you just pray a prayer at an altar and then keep living your life just like everyone else and you prayed a prayer to get to heaven because that's not scriptural. Right? Find it. Find it for me that you pray a prayer to go to heaven. You don't even, it doesn't even say you have to die to go to heaven. These things are mysteries to me. Right? Now, I'm not saying you will put off the flesh. You will put off this tent and you will step into glory. But what do you do with John 17? The Father, the glory you've given me, I've given them. What do you do with that? What do you do with John 17, 3? This is eternal life that they may know you. Okay, stop. This is eternal life. This is heaven. This is the domain of eternity, knowing God. Hopefully we know God. Hopefully. So you're telling me that if knowing you is eternity, then there's something, there's, there's like this glimpse of eternity that we can break into now, but we have a problem called a casual gaze. And we have this idea that I pray a prayer and now I'm just in. But it's not until you go into the holy place and even then where it's anointed, where there's the conferences, speakers are there. You cried, you fell down and everything beyond the veil. No, you're not. I watched one time. I was with my dad somewhere and he was laying hands on people and there was a guy, sweet, sweet Asian man, and he was filming himself like a selfie. And yeah, no joke. This is a true story. My dad didn't see the phone because I think if he would have, he would have broken the phone. But the phone's there. My dad prays for him. He goes down the whole time. He's smiling, doing the selfie. <laughs> Said, bro, this is... You, my friend, are a sweetheart, but you are missing the point. You are... Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, I won't say that, but that is true. Couldn't be more true. Pastor Jenny, very intense. I like it. Just zero to 100 real quick. No, <laughs> I... Uh... But we, we are so whatever goes, right? Yeah. Whatever goes. Yep. But you want to talk about order, preparation, the tabernacle? I mean, yeah. exact colors. And you got to realize these people lifted it up, moved it, put it back down, and had to remake this thing over and over and over again to the exact way God said it. And if it wasn't to the exact way God said it, no glory. Talk about pressure. No glory, right? If, if, the, if, if it's not intertwined, where the colors match up perfectly as he said, no glory. He told Moses, follow the pattern that I give you in the mountain. And I think if God can find something again, after his pattern, we will get some glory again. And it'll be a glory that Mount Sinai won't be able to compare with. This is mind-boggling to me. And I'm tired of reading about Mount Sinai, feeling chills, and then coming to places of worship, and we're not even close to what they can... I mean, I mean if we're being really honest, we are not even touching the surface of the mountain. We preach like we're going up the mountain. Man, worship was powerful. Man, that word and the glory was there. No, it wasn't. Don't devalue the glory by saying it's there when it's not. Right? Yeah, it's the glory of the Lord. I don't even think we know what the glory of the Lord is. 
I don't, and I need to discover more of what his glory is because the glory is not just, is not just the Jesus being present, it's Jesus being present without a veil on. What is that gonna look like in the context of a local church community? What is that gonna look like for our children's church? I mean, what is youth and young adults gonna look like in school of habitation when God sits here unveiled? Man, I feel the Lord. Jesus would say things like, there's so much more I have to tell you, but you're not able to bear it yet. John 16. He said, do not cast your pearls before swine. In the same chapter of Matthew 13, 44 through 46, you can just read it on your own time. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid it, and for the joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys the field. Sorry. The parable of the, the parable, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing here, okay. The parable of the pearl of great price, same chapter. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. But when he found one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all that he had and he bought it. Lord, I pray you adjust our gaze today, God. So many casual about his word casual about his presence, casual about worship. I mean, I, can I just, okay. Sometimes as a leader, people will use my name to get what they want. This doesn't happen here, thank God. And if it does, we need to talk. Sometimes people will say things like, well, Pastor William said, when I never said, right? Because they know that within this local environment, if you say, well, Pastor Williams said, okay, well, then, then we can do it. And when I don't say, this is just in our little circle, when, when they don't say, using my name unmerited to have my authority makes me feel violated, right? Now, in the grand scheme of the universe, like, I'm a local, little local pastor, okay, now I know some of you religious ones, or not religious, spiritual people, are like, you have all authority. I, un- I get it, okay? <laughs> but I can't go knock on the White House door and then let me in. That's just, like, let's just be honest, okay? I-, I pastor a little church, and it's happy, and here I have authority. I leave here, even in my own household. <laughs> I'm just another one of the four. And happened to be the youngest of the four. So this Pastor William thing, all of a sudden is no one in our family, you have to be the loudest to get anything out. It's rude. It's not polite. It's, I remember when Emily and I got together and I would be around her family and they would interrupt each other. The other one would say, I- I'm talking, please don't interrupt me. And I was like, you can do that? <laughs> you can ask them. In our house, it is the loudest wins and no one's offended about it it's just it's just who we are and if they got and we have there's no gossip because because we all are too deep into every into each other's issues we don't believe in gossip we just believe in in aggressive there's no passive aggressiveness it's just aggressive it's true we truly are not passive aggressive as a family it's just overly aggressive my dad sits at a table and he said you know what I heard and just brings it up to everybody. <laughs> I'm not saying that that's like a good model. I'm just, just saying it works for us. It just works for us. And we don't have any problems. We have no problems. Everyone's happy. And if they're not happy, you know about it. And it's over in five minutes. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Pastor Mark's laughing because I feel like he's been at the table sometimes with us. <laughs> with all the noise. But... In my sphere, I, in the grand scheme of life, I don't, I don't, in the authority of the universe, I, just a little right here. Now imagine you sneeze out constellations. You hold planets on nothing. It's round, but when you're on the bottom of it, you're not upside down. 
That might seem silly, like a silly thought to you. I know that there's gravity and stuff, but I don't get it. Why am I not upside down? I told you, I'm just going to throw, this is like my, <laughs> this is like what I think about when I'm going to the bathroom. It's like, <laughs> I had to say it. I'm sitting there like, my wife thinks I'm mad at her. No, I'm trying to figure out why I'm not upside down right now. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen those memes like, the husband and the wife are not facing each other in bed, and the wife's thinking, oh my gosh, he's so mad, he must have done this, and the husband's like, what would I do if I was attacked by a bear? That's, that's like, that is like the most true memes there could ever be. Why are you so quiet? I, I'm not quiet, I just, I'm thinking about the universe. I don't know. I, so anyway, getting off topic here. Just trying to soften you up, because it's gonna get intense. But imagine... That one, that man, the father of glory, uncreated eternity dwells inside of him. And we casually say, God said. Oh, doesn't it? I mean, when you hear it like that, even in all the joking, you're still like, oh, no. And I'm not saying that God doesn't speak. We actually, we are designed to hear God's voice. We are designed to prophesy. But I think that there's a weightiness coming to the prophetic. We've been talking about it. This weightiness of, let me tell you a cultural thing here. You will not be practice for the prophetic. We don't play with God's voice. We're not going to play games around the prophetic. Now, I know that offends like a hundred cultures, but I don't care. This is, this is what God is telling us here that the most precious thing that could ever be uttered out of our mouth is the Yahweh Almighty God said. And there's a different kind of weight when you're going, did he really say this? Or am I using this to get my way? I can't tell you how much I see that in the predict. Well, I just really feel, stop feeling stuff and really make sure you're hearing stuff. I feel the Lord is not like, entangled in, in your emotional, what you go through. He, he is God. And we have to get back to God. When we say God said, that is like the most precious thing that could ever touch our lips in our entire life. And the children of Israel, listen, they understood this measure of honor, this not casual gaze so much that when Jesus, when God said, Jesus, when God said, after telling Moses, Moses is like, well, who do I say sent me? He says, tell him I am that I am sent you. Right? It was so sacred, that, that word. And one of these days, we're going to expand on what that really means. But we can't today because you would leave. So anyway, <laughs> I am that I am was so precious. That word I am, Yahweh is an abbreviation translated I am. They wouldn't even say I am because it was so precious, so holy, so sacred to them that they would abbreviate it with Yahweh. Anyone, have, anyone know that? We have to be students of the word. Today, it's uh, Papa Daddy's my boyfriend. And we wonder why there's no glory. I'm not saying you can't call him Papa. You can call him whatever you want. Just make sure in its abbreviation for something that is the most sacred thing in your life. He's getting things in this hour. I'm, with this, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about the church at large. I am talking to this house. He is getting things in order. I told our leaders, I said, if, if it feels like it applies to you, this got me in trouble, but I'm gonna say it again. If it feels like it applies to you, it probably does. There's, we, we are beating around the bush just too much. Anything goes, anything is said, and I'm really not bringing correction because there's nothing to correct. There is just new measures. Nothing's changing. Things are growing, and there's new measures that God wants to introduce us to that are going to require something of not common gaze anymore. And my heart is, is that we get baptized into the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Listen, until like it says, Isaiah 45, 3. Actually, don't go there. Psalms 14. 
I'm going to go back to Isaiah. I mean, I'm only reading a verse, but I guess you can turn there. Two and three. Listen, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there's anyone who understands. To see if there's anyone who gets it. Think about, you are God all alone. And you're looking for some people that'll see you at the value in which you should be seen at. And the reason he's worthy of that value is because his value for you is beyond comprehension and he has holes in his hands to prove it. Holes in his feet to prove it. He's got a scar in his side to prove it that you can stick your hand into. I'm excited for that day. Right, he's worthy of this because God became a man. But he looks down from heaven to see if there's anybody who gets it, who understands. Who seeks after God? But listen, they all have turned aside. That is a bold statement. It's not like some and there was a remnant. He's saying here, but all have turned aside. And I would go as far as saying, I think in every single one of our lives with me included, I think every single one of us in some way have some sort of casual gaze toward God. And I think we'd be lying to say we've got it all figured out and we are in awe and wonder every time we look at the tree. Because if you can look on that tree and it does nothing in your heart, there's something common, familiar. There's a familiar spirit that God wants to remove. And I'm not telling you you gotta be crying all the time. I'm just telling you, his presence causes something to erupt in you. And you go into environments and then silence hits. I'm, I was intentional today. Because we don't know what to do in silence. Silence in this environment, if you have silence for 20 minutes, it is like bliss to some and slow death to others. Because <laughs> we're looking for what's next. Are they gonna play the drums anytime soon? Are they gonna get off the floor? What, what is how, I'm just gonna sit down and I'm gonna wait. Not wait on God, wait on the worship team to take me to the next part of the service. We don't, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. So we start screaming because it, num, because it numbs the fact that we're empty. Here's what I'm after. I'm after the silence ministering. I'm after like God fills a room in such a capacity that we don't need to say anything because I'll tell you, in the most holy place, it's silent. There's not even light in there. The holy place, there's the candlestick. You gotta keep filling it. The table of showbread, you gotta keep putting showbread on it. The altar of incense, you gotta keep that altar burning. You gotta put the incense on it. And the light is from the candlestick that the priests are lighting. But then you go beyond the veil. You might die there, but that's what it says. And you, you go in, they'd go in once a year, and the light in there wasn't man-made. The light in there was the glory of God. There was, there was no more working in there. Man ended. It's, it is, it's the Chronicles, listen, it's the Quran, 2 Chronicles 5. It, if you read it, it talks about when the priest started to do this as one. They were all in the same pursuit. It was only then when they were as one, it said the priest could not continue. Stop. What God is bringing us to is that we are not going to be able to continue. And Hebrews 8 and Isaiah 30 is going to come on the scene where the teacher, the master is going to become pastor of the house. And sometimes the biggest hindrance we have is anointed men. Because they love filling the candlestick for everybody. They love showing off the showbread. Look at what I've created for the Lord. You have to get out of the way. Because what we're producing is a casual gaze at celebrity Christians. We're impressed. I mean, think about what we are, the stupidity of what we are impressed. We are impressed today as a young generation by numbers of followers on Instagram. You have somebody that follows you with 200,000 followers. Honestly, look at your heart in that moment and ask yourself, does this make me feel good? We don't, I know we don't talk about this, but everybody has that problem. Except for maybe like 50 and above. We need you to lay hands on us. <laughs> They don't understand Instagram. I bless you. 
Stay confused. It's stupid. And the gospel was powerful before TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. It was, it was available before YouTube. I mean, he was pretty successful with all your stupid TikTok videos where you're dancing like a fool to win Gen Z. They don't need your dancing. They need his presence. They need his power. They need, listen, they need to come into environments like this where they're confused out of their minds. That's what they need. They need to walk in and go, I don't understand anything happening here, but I am shaking on the inside. Come here, all you who are weary, thirsty, heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'm going to give you a drink that you don't even, listen, you don't even know that you need it until you drink it. Instagram and celebrities, they can't give you that. And I'm telling you, you are going to watch in this hour, God begin to chop down this whole celebrity, demonic, Christian thing where we're impressed with the anointing of men. He's bringing us beyond the veil. And beyond the veil, you are not relevant. You're not needed. <laughs> you minister to him in the holy place. That's what, we're, that's, what our, that's what our mission is. And then God comes in with the low note and everything begins to shake and you shut up. Help us, Jesus. Isaiah 45, three, don't turn there, just listen. I will give you the treasures of darkness. What are you talking about? And hidden riches of secret places. The word the and of are not in the original. They're, they're added to the English language. So listen, I will give you treasures in darkness. I will give you hidden riches in secret places. It's, it's not for everybody. Like, we just got to accept that. Well, let me say it differently. It's for everybody, but not everybody responds to it. We'll just edit that up. He loves everybody. Everybody's welcome into his kingdom, but not everybody says yes. That I may know, listen, that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you didn't know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. That word, secrets, I will give you the secrets. I will give you treasures in hidden places. In the secret places, that word secret is, I'm going to give you something that's close to me. It means to be kept close. There's hidden treasure, listen, in him that is reserved only for those who come close. People that seek after. It's why, again, Psalms 14, it says, there's no one who seeks. Before my grandmother died, I shared it at, at I think it was the last prayer room. I don't remember, though. And... She would call my dad, she would speak in Arabic to him, and she would say, tell William or whoever she was prophesying to go and read this from this verse to this verse. This is what God's saying. She died in 2016. The last prophecy she gave me was actually over as a nation. We had started in 2014. We weren't a church yet. We were just in coffee shops. And I don't know what we were doing, but we were in a coffee shop. Um, but in 2016... No, it would have been probably 15. She gave me this word, Ezekiel 47. And we, we shared it, but the narrative of Ezekiel 47 is there's water that begins to come out of the threshold, of, underneath the threshold of the temple. Like water starts going out of the bottom of the door. And the word water there means seed in Ezekiel 47. Like literally male seed. You know what I'm talking about? It's re the, the water is reproductive, that's why it grows. And what starts, it says, as the ankles, it says it's then gonna come up to the knees, right? And you're gonna realize this thing is building. This, this thing is raising, right? What we think is building is when more people come. I would tell you sometimes when people leave, it starts building. Because they're distracting with their offenses. But it starts to build and it starts to build until you are having to swim in it. How many of you are ready to go swimming? I, I know it's almost winter, but I, need a, I want this to be a pool. Like, I, 
I am so done with the ankle deep, we're just splashing, having a good time, and everything's good, but we're still looking like everything in the world. It's time to swim. And it says that this is going to turn into a river, a reproductive river, the whole river seed. And it says on the banks of the river, right? On the banks of the river, there's healing in the leaves that are close to the river. And everywhere the river goes, I will heal the nations. And this river, this pure river is going to go into the salty ocean and it's going to turn it all into purity. This is Habakkuk 2, that the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Here's what we will not do here, is we will not be here another 20 years doing the same thing and not experiencing new measures of glory. I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in us having a two and a half hour service, having joy and all these, and exciting and tears and all of this stuff, but we don't sense the water rising. And how we know the water's rising is we can't play in it anymore, we have to swim in it. How we know the water is rising is we watch ourselves slowly get out of the way and we watch the Lord slowly take his place. What usually happens in churches is as you get bigger, you start to get more redefined. Let's cut out worship. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this because this is what the people love. And we have two problems and it's not just offense. It's also the fear of man. Churches called seeker friendly rather than God friendly building everything around people, and we are violating the glory of the Lord. I don't want to just be different to be different. I want to be different on purpose. With, we have a mark, an aim that we are aiming after, and it's I don't want just the, the side effects of God's presence. I want his actual unveiled face in our midst. Anyone want this? 2 Chronicles twenty two nineteen. 19. Just write it down. Don't turn there. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build, listen, the sanctuary of the Lord so that you may bring the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the glory of the Lord, and sacred articles, sacred, the sacred things belonging to God into the temple that will be built for the Lord. Built for the Lord. I believe, listen, that God has restrained his glory until we begin to build according to his pattern. And so many are asking for his glory, but we have so watered down this Christian life and what church is truly supposed to be in the West that I think it'd be dangerous for us to get what we are asking for so casually. Matthew, or sorry, Psalms 25, 12 through 15, just write all these verses down. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in his way, the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. The secret of God. Again, that word secret there in Hebrew is the intimate company of God. The intimate company of he keeps intimate company with those who fear him. My eyes are forever. It says he'll show them his covenant. My eyes are forever toward the Lord. So we know that the glory of the Lord is found in the face of Jesus. He is the express image, right, of the glory of the Lord. Hebrews 1, 3, and we're getting somewhere. He is the radiance, listen, of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So again, I said it, the Pharisees had the presence of God, but they didn't get to experience the glory of God because of the gaze they had. When I was preparing for this, I heard the Lord say something really intense. And I have to be obedient to what he said, even if it bothers you. But I heard him say exactly this. My people do not know what they're asking for when they ask for my glory. When it comes, it'll reward many, and it'll be the reward of many, but it'll be the destruction of many as well. I will consume everything. Our job is to begin to get you to see the glory of the Lord now. Because here's what it does, and we're gonna end in Joshua 3. It causes you to leave everything. 
And if you can get consumed with it now, now, but we have this idea, right? Because I know, I, I know that the Lord is good. I, I get it. I, I know that God is, we are gonna hear the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. It is a good story, but it's a good story for you. But there's a whole world. There's a whole world that wants nothing to do with him. There's a whole church that wants nothing to do with him. And until, listen, what we've had is we've had heralds. We've had trumpets. We've had people that usually are hated while they're alive. And then they, someone writes a book about them after they die and then we love them. Like, you know, people like uh, Leonard Ravenhill. He said, ooh, because in his meetings, after his meetings, if you walked in the city after his meetings, you'd find TV screens smashed on the ground. This man preached with such conviction, so much the fear of the Lord. He was hated in his day. And man, this isn't loving. This is not the love of God. I would tell you that the wrath of God is consumed by his love in his mercy in waiting to reveal his glory. And I feel this, man, to him who has an ear, let him hear, because I know some of you I lost about 25 minutes ago. And I would encourage you, I, I, I mean, this is not gonna encourage you. Oh, I shouldn't say it. No. I, I'm not looking for everybody. I, I'm, I'm just not. I, our heart is, is for everybody, but you see, I am driven. I am, I am literally possessed by something. Not that good. <laughs> but I am possessed by this thought that we could see the glory of the Lord on the earth. I, I'm possessed by it. I'm possessed by this thought. I, I've been in ministry and church for way too long to just want the same old crap. And I'm not saying what I've been in is crap, Lord. No, it carved us into what we are today. But what I'm telling you is, is that I am done with the ebbs and the flows of generation to generate. One generation has a fad where they're in suits. The next generation looks like they're in blankies. And, and we can't, we were trying to figure out what is the new thing God's doing. He doesn't care about your dress. But there's a posture. And here's one thing that I've watched decrease from generation to generation. And we have become more casual. Young people, we have become too casual with the presence of the Lord. The way that we worship, the way that we sing, and I'm not talking about here, but if the shoe fits, kick it off. I love what Todd's, just kick it off. But I'm not responsible for the church on the street. I'm responsible for this house. And I have a fear in my heart so much, I literally shook last night going to sleep because I know that this loses people. People just want encouragement, a bagel, and get out of here and go home. This is not your house. There's like 15 churches just on this road, and they might offer something more bagel and cream cheese-like. I want steak every service. I, I, I want steak every single one. And, and I just am not willing we're not willing. We will never, ever, ever become casual. And if we do, we're going to get violent. <laughs> violent about staying in awe and in wonder. It's why we're so intense about if God's in the room. Don't sit there casually. Well, I'm going to go somewhere where they just accept me for who I am. I'm all about you coming as you are. I'm very much against you staying as you are. And, and, and we've got life coaches. The word mentor is not in the Bible. Mentor this, man, he's my life. Because you don't want to attach yourself to anything. You don't want to be in the family of something. Because see, fathers and sons, there's a, there's a weight now. And that weight is, is you're going to carry the identity. You're going to carry the weight of it. You're not just going to casually go from this conference and that conference and we're picking up a little bit of what they're saying and what they're saying and we got everybody else's doctrine we have no idea what we believe and we've got to listen to more things to bring us peace because we ourselves like it says in psalms 14 aren't seeking so we don't understand i'm 
I'm desperate, desperate to have a house where the glory of God is honored by the right gaze, okay? Go to Joshua 3. This is where we're gonna end. If I can have the worship team come up. Again, the mystery of the glory of God, the secrets of God are revealed. The secrets of God are revealed to those whose gaze is correct. Joshua 3, and I do want you to see this. I'm gonna start halfway in verse one. So they are about to cross over the Jordan. All right? It says, they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel. You guys there? And they lodged there before they passed over. And at the end of of the three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, listen to this, as soon as you see the ark, everyone say as soon, no delay. As soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Another translation says, then you shall leave everything and follow it. If you go on, it says in verse five, and Joshua said to the people after giving them instructions of, I mean, down to you had to be 2,000 cubics, whatever that is in length, from the Ark of the Covenant. Like you had to be exactly in order. When you see it lifted up, follow it. Leave everything and follow it. And here's the distance in which you are supposed to follow it. And then he goes on, verse five. And Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant, which is the symbolization, listen, it's his glory, symbolizing his glory. Take his glory and lift it. And pass on before the people. So they took the Ark, they took the glory, and they went before the people. I feel like this, Joshua 3, is our mission statement as a house. Pick up the ark and lift it. Now, here's the thing. You couldn't see the priests that were lifting it. You just saw the ark. The people didn't, they weren't impressed by who was under it. They just saw it. And when they saw it, they left everything to follow it. I would tell you that in glimpses, we've experienced this. And it's not just here. It's not, we're not the only place. Hear my heart. There is thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of remnants of people that are sick and tired of just going through the motions. There's thousands all over the world that God is raising that they don't know how to stop worshiping. They're really bad with time. If you need to pray, if you have the gift of intercession, please intercede for our children's workers. But we have this obsession that we're not very good at stopping. There's thousands, thousands of, of churches and people, I believe, pursuing this very same thing. But the mission and what we're seeing happen is, is I think our biggest church growth has not come from local communities. We, somebody thought when they passed a house for him that this was a, well, I'm sure you could put it together if you have no idea what that means. A house for him that isn't him, you know, like... People are confused looking at our building, and I love it. The veil just veiled because it's too precious to put our name on it. It's funny what people have thought driving by. I've got so many things going through my head that would cause uh, the anointing to leave. So, But listen, this is the faceless generation that's been prophesied for generations of lifting up the veil or lifting up the ark and you can't see anything else. You just see the ark. You just see the glory. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter three, really quick, really, really quick. Here's where it begins, okay? 
going to read a good amount, so just stick with me. 2 Corinthians 3, start in verse 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, not sufficient in ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God, who has made us, listen, sufficient to minister of the new covenant. I love it because Paul here is like setting them up. He's setting them up for something really offensive by making sure that they know that this isn't about you, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's brilliant in the way that he writes and he teaches of, don't forget, I'm about to tell you something that make, may make you think that you're sufficient, but you ain't, okay? I'm all for, we, we herald, herald the message of identity. Just make sure you remember it's his identity in you, not your identity. You, you, your identity is worthless and withering away. It's why you have to die. And Christ in you is the hope of glory. Okay, so Paul's setting them up, man. He's, he's getting their hearts right. He's saying, you are not sufficient in yourselves. And he goes on and he says, um, the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. Let's get to verse seven. Now, if the ministry of death, I, I need you to, to think with me here. You're telling me, Paul, that Mount Sinai was the ministry of death? That's, that's offensive. The ministry of death carved in letters of stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze. There's that word. They couldn't gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. The point was death. That's why it's called the ministry of death. That's the point. The point was to bring us to a place of we can't do this. Will not the ministry, listen, of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. For if we have for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, how much more what is permanent have glory. Since we have such hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites may not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. I want you to remember that. They couldn't gaze at him because of the outcome that was being brought to an end. Remember this, that glory upon Moses was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened for to this day when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. If you think that's only for the Jewish people in Israel, you are deceived because that same veil lays over hundreds of thousands of Christians that go to church to get their fix to get the next little tagline that the preacher said, and I'm gonna go home with a Band-Aid rather than the blood of Christ flowing through my veins. Listen, that same veil remains unlifted. Verse 15, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. When his gaze gets corrected, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, everyone say all, with an unveiled face. I love it. It also means with an open face. Like the hand no longer has to be on the sun. But we with an open face. Because I've been asking, Lord, what is your glory? Show me your glory. And this is where he led. But 
we all with an unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror or being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Jump over to verse five of chapter four. Listen, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. He's got it in the beginning and he's got it in the end because he just said probably the most offensive these Jewish people have uh, thing these Jewish people have ever heard in their lives. Time out. You're saying that we mirror, mirror image the glory of God. Who do you think that you are? And not only that, they couldn't look at Moses and he's saying you all with unveiled faces look into a mirror and behold the glory of God. What? For God who said, let light shine, listen, out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Or in the presence, that word is. But we have this treasure. We have this treasure. Some of you are just staring at me. Look, you're going to go to, look at your Bible. Look at your Bible and read it. But we have this treasure. Read it again. Oh, I guess there's a Bible behind me. Sorry. That's on me. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The reason you have the treasure is to expose God and not us. It's the reason it's yours, right? Go to verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into his presence for it is all for your sake so that as grace extends more and more people it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God so do not lose heart though your outer self is wasting away our inner self is being renewed day by day for this momentary affliction is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory behold eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison and as we look not to things that are seen but to the things that are unseen there it is again as you look and you search in the dark places in the mysterious places in the hidden places for the things that are seen are transit but the things that are are unseen are eternal I think we just keep going. Chapter five. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting on we may be not found naked. For while we are still in the tent, we groan being burdened, not that we be unclothed, but that we be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This is the consuming glory of God. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So in other words, the more you realize the right gaze is found in a mirror. We who are glory givers, we give God glory. He said in John 17, the glory you've given me, I have given them. This is what I believe the coming of heaven and earth coming together is gonna look like. We're gonna give God glory and his glory is gonna come down and glory is gonna meet in the middle. And we are gonna see the glory of the Lord 
the knowledge of God's glory cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But here's where it starts. Behold, look into a mirror. And here's a problem. Here's our problem is that we believe more in the veil. We believe more in the veil than we believe in the most holy place. And here's what that looks like in the context of a local community. God's about to take over and we're all gonna stop talking. Here's what that looks like in the context of worship sets. Worship is gonna get to such a point, such a fragrance as you stand to your feet, come on. Such a point, such a fragrance that just like you look at the sun, S-U-N, and it blinds you and distracts you from anything and everything else around you. I mean, you literally look at the sun and you become blind for two minutes. How much more the actual glory of the Lord, not just some star. I mean, think about it. Jesus in the flesh, he gets up on a mountain and his face shines like the sun. And these three men that are with him drop as dead men. There is mysteries in God that are hidden from the common gaze. And my prayer is, is that God return us back to the right gaze, which starts in this one thing. Behold, in the mirror, the glory of the Lord. And if that doesn't cause you to go, oh my goodness, what are we doing in this room? I don't want to have worship sets. I don't want to just have, I think we worship worship in our culture. I don't want to have good preaching and teaching, although we need it and it's good. We need to get over our offenses. We need to get free from all of our junk. We need to learn how to overcome temptation. All those things are good, but there's a root that is just not dealt with enough in the church. And it's that God is interested. He's looking for places that are attractive. They're gonna come into rooms. God himself is gonna walk into rooms. He's gonna walk into rooms and everything is gonna drop as a dead man before him. The priests will not be able to continue. So come on, lift your hands. Restore awe again. I pray this morning, Lord, that you baptize us in the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That you deliver us from casual, familiar spirits. If you don't understand anything I'm saying, just agree with this one thing. Say, deliver me from a familiar spirit toward you, God. Deliver me from a familiar spirit towards you, God. I'm not taking away God's, no, you don't have to to, to repeat this part. I appreciate it though. I'm not taking away your personal beautiful. If you want to have coffee and, and you make a cup for him, that's, I love it. Go for it. <laughs> Can I share one story? <laughs> Pastor Gerardo one time. I, I walked into his apartment and he's sitting there in his underwear. Why? I don't know. I said, what are you doing, man? He said, I was just dancing before the Lord and there's an empty cup of coffee and a full cup of coffee on the other side of the table. I said, was somebody with you in here? Cause, and he said, no, that one was for Jesus. I said, I just want to give you the, a hug. I, I need more of that childlikeness in my life. Just put a shirt on, yeah. Um, <laughs> you remember that? That really impacted me. I'm like, I'm gonna start making cure eggs for the Lord. Um, I'm not against that. If, if whatever your thing that you do, like Pastor G, if you want to dance naked before the Lord and that, do whatever. You, I don't care and please don't tell me about it. I, here's what I'm after. I'm after God not becoming a routine to us. I'm after God not becoming our Sunday morning thing. Like this week is gonna be a test for us. I am like, I, I'm, I am sick to my stomach over the fact that we can't have prayer rooms this week. And I know we have to, we have to turn this building up. It's like, we, there's a lot we've got to accomplish in here. 
and I still feel an air draft and I'm so thankful. But I think it'll be a good test of, you get into the cycle of, all right, it's Sunday again, I gotta put my holy cap on. And we come in and we wait for Kaylee to go into the right song. Here's what the priest's jobs part is. Lift up the ark. And as you lift it, everyone stop what you're doing, follow it. Stop what you're doing, forget about the healing that you need, forget about the depression that you need to get over, follow the ark. Just follow the glory. And you're gonna, all of a sudden, you're gonna be walking and dancing like Jenna before the Lord. And you're just gonna realize, oh my gosh, my, my legs are feeling better. My, I feel like a sound mind. This is that day of Hebrews 8 of we won't need to tell you to know the Lord. We're just going to lift the ark up and everyone's going to go, there he is. Stop what you're doing and go, there he is. So come on, lift your hands. asking God that you take the veil off of this house we're so thankful Lord for how you've came we're so thankful God for how you've come but Lord we don't want the effects of your presence we want the unveiling of your presence we want your glory one man asked for the glory of God in the old covenant God said, go hide in the cliff of the rock. Here's God, hundreds of people saying, show us your glory in the new covenant, Lord. In the face of Jesus. Take the veil off. Come on, just ask him, say, take the veil off. Take the veil off. Would you just begin to pray in the spirit? your attention on him. This is where we lift the ark. This is where we lift the ark. This is where we lift the ark. We don't want casual. Deliver us from casual gaze. May the fear of the Lord come back. May the fear of the Lord come back in this generation, Lord. The fear of the Lord come back in this generation, God.
Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow I'll do wonders among you. If you know that you've had a casual, familiar spirit toward the Lord, I want you to lift your hand. And as much as you can fit, I know we do it, but I just love the prophetic act of doing something, leaving where you are. I want you to just come to the front and if your hand just go and then go into the aisles there's just this act of leaving where you are and getting before the Lord and we're consecrating this house to him come on do it quick God, here we are consecrating ourselves, asking God that you would forgive us for being casual in our gaze toward you. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you again, Lord. to you, God, as a church, as a risen nation. On behalf of this community, that whenever we see the ark lifted up, we will leave everything behind and we will follow. Deliver us from ourselves, the veil of our own problems. And I pray that in this house, in these physical walls, that we experience the presence of Jesus unveiled, unveiled. We don't just simply want the effects, God. We want the whole thing. We want all of the lamb. We've come to eat and consume all of the lamb. Bring 
ask God to nothing, that you may become everything. In your own way, with your own mouth, just consecrate yourself to the Lord just for two minutes and we're done. Just consecrate yourself to the Lord. Ask him to forgive you. You're giving your attention to so many things. <laughs> giving your attention to so many things. doesn't forget this simple act of it's not about what you feel or don't feel God sees he sees we are coming to him and our words are enough Daniel 10 says I came because of your words so here we are God saying show us your glory in Keller Texas God actual manifestation God something that the world can see they can say I've never experienced anything like I've seen in that room not because we are sufficient in ourselves but because our sufficiency is in you so come Lord Jesus come bring us into deeper depths of who you are give you glory and honor and everybody said amen this is what I think it should look like I think the most precious, sweetest moments with God are the ones that cause us to stop everything. The ones where we stop talking, we stop making noise, and we fall on our face before Him. So here's our prayer. Take over. God, take over. Amen? I expect the next Sunday, as God just lingers and waits for us in this room, next Sunday something break out unlike anything we've ever seen we're building equity with him but I would ask that you never walk into this building again casual amen if you want bagels and tea and coffee I think we actually have coffee here and that's fine but this isn't about the bagels and coffee I want our posture as we walk through the threshold of this door to be I'm going to swim today I'm not waiting for God to come and touch me. I'm going to touch him, and I'm going to swim until God changes everything. Amen? All right. You can get yourself off the floor if you're able. Give somebody a hug. It's kind of a weird way to end service. But we love you, bless you. And honestly, hey, I, I have a request. Hold on, time out. I have a request. Could we dedicate this room to the Lord? in such a sense that like right now, we don't just start having like conversations in here, but if you have to have a conversation, even our, I want our prayer team, if you need prayer for anything to be here, if you need prayer, you can come. But if you're just like chit-chatting, can you do that in the lobby? Can we do that moving forward and allow God to just continue to rest in here? Because I think God's still touching people and I want him to, and we don't need to hear about your week, okay? We can hear about it in the lobby. Love you guys. Go in quiet and in peace.